A question and answer session will commence shortly. May I again invite Professor Richard Wong, our moderator for the Q&A, to the stage. Professor Wong, please. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Lin. I think you covered, as you say, uh, two sides of the imbalance with advice and policy advice for both the developed economy, specifically the United States, and for the less developed economy, specifically China. What I would like to do is uh, now open this up uh, for a question and answer, much as I would like to monopolize the discussion. <laughs> but you have spoken against monopolies. So, uh, questions. Um, I can see that. George. George, you're a graduate of uh, economics in 1966, now a director of ICBC Asia. Professor Lin, you have given us a very comprehensive account of the present economic situation. As you know, the G20 just had a meeting in uh, Scotland. They seem to come up to agreement on the stimulus package, mm. but yet arrive on the climate change and energy issue between the developed and developing countries. And I'm, I'm glad that to hear that towards the end of your lecture, you talk about the energy issue, the role of the World Bank. How would you address the difference between the developed and developed countries on these em environment issues? Because it can be affecting the uh, global economic imbalance. Can you elaborate? Thank you. The environment issue, you refer to the, regarding the climate change or those kind of issue? Okay. Well, climate change is a global issue. And certainly, we need to have global effort. And I think now we have some kind of consensus. The best we can get in the coming years is to you know, control the CO2 emission to the level of 450s. And so the temperature increase will be controlled around 2%, uh, around 2 degrees centigrade higher than the pre-industrial level. That was the best we can hope. But to achieve that, we need to reduce the CO2 emission, need to increase the energy efficiency. But the dilemma is there. For the developing country to grow, they need to use more energy. And when they use more energy, then the CO2 emission is likely to increase. Unless some kind of new technology is provided to them. That's one thing. And secondly, if we want to adopt this new technology, there are some costs. And so the issue is that who is going to provide that technology and who is going to provide the cost? I think from the equity, from the equity point of view, from the fairness point of view, the high income country need to contribute the most. Because we know now the accumulation of CO2 in the world was mainly as a result of industrialization since the 18th century. And on a per capita basis, the developing country, their contribution to that was less than 25%. And so, you know, the challenge now is how to find an equitable, equitable way, equitable way that to share the responsibility that these developing country, they need to do something, they need to understand that, but at the same time, 
the developed country we need to contribute the technology and the funding. If we can, you know, agree on a framework, then the best we can hope is to hold the temperature increase at around 2 percent that are before the pre-industrial revolution. If we cannot achieve this kind of goal, if temperature increase too much, then I would say the developing country, they are going to suffer the most. They contribute to this global warming the least. And they were also this prepared to cope with the global warming. And they are likely to suffer the most. And so it's very important for us to understand it's a global challenges. We need to take action now. We need to have the action together with the high income country and also the developing country. And if we can do that to you know, behave differently in a high income country and in a low income country, we have an opportunity. We still have an opportunity to make this damage in a, in a controllable range. Thank you. Fred, Professor Ma. <laughs> Professor Lin, thank you very much for your inspiring lecture. Um, I want to ask a question relating to China. Mm. With the strong loan growth during the last year, almost a US one trillion, and with the stock market doing very well, very high PE relative to the US, and property prices escalating in certain cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Do you see a bubble developing in China? And if you do see a bubble, will it burst? And when? Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, if I can answer your last two questions, I will become billionaire. <laughs> you all know that. If I can predict when the bubble is going to burst, I can short it and then I'll be billionaire, right? So I don't know when it's going to burst or not. And whether this kind of situation is sustainable or not very much depends on the government policies. And you know the Chinese government is very cautious about the equity market situation, housing market situation. On the one hand, we know it's important to maintain the fiscal stimulus and so the demand in China, investment demand in China, can be maintained in a reasonable level. And if investment demand in China can be maintained in a reasonable level, it will create job, it will increase the wage, consumption will also be supported. So I think a continue the fiscal stimulus is important, and the Chinese government is committed to that. But at the same time, certainly, the Chinese government need to pay attention to the likely bubble in the housing market as well as in the equity market. And you can see the Chinese government try to fine tune those two markets. And uh, if we look into the past experiences, it seems to give us the confidence that the Chinese government you know, will be able to uh, 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 make the situation in a uh, in a bearable or controllable manners. Question, yes, gentlemen there. Professor Lin, um, my question is also about China. Yeah. Um, can the government in China successfully have a policies that will lead it to be less export driven and more to domestic yeah. consumption driven. No country in Asia has done it yet. Well, I think that um, Chinese government, like any government in East Asia, try to you know, promote dynamic economic growth. And in the process of dynamic economic growth period, globalization it's very important because you need to be able to export in order to import what you do not have, including technology, including equipment, and so on. So I like to say that Chinese economy will maintain an open economy. And during this period of time, as long as the Chinese economy grows very dynamically, 
export will increase a lot, and import will also increase a lot. And the issue is a large trade surplus. As I mentioned, the large trade surplus related to the structural problem I mentioned, income distribution problem I mentioned. If in the coming year, the Chinese government can collect those kind of structural imbalance, certainly consumption will increase, and a saving will decline somewhat. And under that kind of situation, Chinese economy is, will have a more balanced growth path than what we observe now. We have one more question on that side. Okay, we have the young man there in the white, yeah, stand up. Yes, oh, not you, the other one behind you. <laughs> Thank you so sir. if you don't stand up fast, you'll miss the opportunity. <laughs> Oh, sorry, uh, Honorable Professor, I have two questions for you. The first is that uh, uh, as the, the dollar is in the process of devaluation, so how China can protect its benefit and uh, what's the role of World Bank in the next few years? And the second question is that as it's well known that you're very, you are a very good swimmer uh, considering <laughs> in 1979 and you make your greatest decision to, to swim to China and I want to, the question is that uh, which trivial things that and factors make, uh, help to make the decision? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, whether the U.S. dollar will further devalue or not, I don't know. Because again, if I don't know, if I know, I can also short it, I can also become billionaire, right? So I don't know. And it's hard to say the US dollar will continue to devalue, will continue to appreciate. For example, after the financial crisis, in most cases, we expect the dollar value to depreciate. But we know that actually it appreciates. And now the global, now US economy started to recover. In most cases, we expect if we have an economic recovery, the value of the currency should be strengthened. But we see the US dollar, you know, started to devalue. And I think that make, you know, some traders, some speculators had opportunity to make money. But I'm a theorist, I'm an economist, I'm not a speculator. So I cannot predict whether it's going to appreciate or it's going to depreciate. And uh, regarding, well, <laughs> well, I, I think that at your age, just like you, I'm, you know, romantic. <laughs> I have some idea. I like to do something that I trust. But I'm a lucky person, you know. When I try to do something and eventually prove to be right. But I would say, I'm just a lucky person, but I just like you, young and uh, inspired and try to do something good for you know, society, for the nation, for the world. And I think that as long as you have those uh, you know, aspirations, I'm sure maybe you will be as lucky as I am. Time is running out, and we will have one more question for a student. So who will stand we, up? We, we need to have a gender balance, you know. Only men ask me, we yeah. should have some. If you are a girl, stand up right away. Ah, you missed it. <laughs> Would you be gracious enough to let the uh, g lady behind you take your chance, and you can? I promise we will. Uh... I'll answer two questions. Okay. <laughs> First, I want to thank the, thank you. Um, I don't know your name, but thank you. And I have a question because Mr. Ling, you said in your speech last, like, you think the saving, the extraordinary high saving rate in China is the main reason of it is because of the income imbalance, and because like the the financial structure doesn't really offer enough opportunities for the poorer people. Um, but I also notice, like um, many people, save money because they are afraid when they get old, they don't have enough money to protect themselves from other, you know, yeah. if they are sick or something. 
So I think it's also an issue related to the welfare, social welfare system. Um, do you agree on it? Uh, would you elaborate it for me for a while? Thank you. Uh, I think that's an issue people often attribute to say that a high saving in China is because of the lack of social protection, and so people need to save more. However, if you look at the data carefully, the saving in China, about half from the household saving. The other half were even more from the corporate saving. And if you look into the household saving, it was around 20 to 25 percent. And for the household saving to have 20 to 25 percent of GDP, it was very similar to the household saving in India. So China was not higher than the household saving in India. What made the Chinese saving so high, the difference was the corporate saving. And why the corporate saving is much higher than other developing countries, it was the reason I just attribute to. Because of the structural distortion in the Chinese system. Make the corporate or rich people to have a much larger share of the GDP. And we know they cannot consume so much. So they need to save a lot. They, they, they will save a lot. They, they need to make a lot of investment. But certainly, by no means, I, that, that the improvement in the social protection, improvement in the household, in, in the health care, or you know, unemployment protection and so on, those are important. And uh, those are important not because of the high saving we observe in China. Because uh, if you want to enter into a market system, the individual will face more risk. And if we use the social program that will reduce the individual risk, can enhance the individual welfare. And the marginality that may improve a little bit of the you know, consumption and reduce a little bit of household saving. However, if we have more social protection, that means that the government needs to tax more, right? The government needs to impose higher tax. And so disposal income to the people will be reduced, right? So just like you know, some kind of social insurance, you, you, know, you will not increase your consumption because you have insurance. Because before you buy your insurance, you have to pay some money for that. It reduces your disposal income. So for that, from, from, that, from that perspective, I think the main reason for the high saving in China is not because of the lack, the, 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 you know, the, the, the backwardness of the social protection system. It's mainly the structural issue I just discussed. Although it is time, but since you are so gracious, would you like to ask your question now? <laughs> Uh, hopefully, there's a, no another lady standing up. Yeah, <laughs> you are the last person. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. I thank right. you, uh, Professor Lin. Uh, as a student in economics, I really like to discuss the economic contemporary issues with my friends. Yeah. Uh, however, I know uh, to practice is different uh, as talking in a very uh, textbook way. So, could you uh, share with us your experience? about how, how, what's the similarity and the difference between the role as an economic scholar and uh, uh, economic advisor for the government? Thank you. Well, I'm an, an economist by training. And when I involved in the policy discussion, also because I'm an economist. But um, the way an economist can make a contribution, we need to understand theory based on phenomena, observe phenomena. And observe in phenomena means those are phenomena in the past. The phenomena we are encountering now sometimes may be similar to the phenomena in the past. The mechanism for the reason 
of this kind of phenomena may be similar, but sometimes it can be different. And so when you to try to participate in this policy discussion, you cannot just rely on theory. You need to understand the economic phenomenon by itself. If you understand the economic phenomenon and understand the mechanism behind the phenomenon, sometimes your policy conclusion will be similar to the policy conclusion as in the past. But sometimes it can be different. For example, I just say, under the current situation, because of excess capacity, government fiscal stimulus is very important. And that is Keynes idea, fiscal stimulus. However, if you look into the literature, many economists oppose fiscal stimulus because they say if government spend more money now, in the future they need to tax more. And the people will start to save more. And so under the kind of situation, the government demand support by the government increase, but the demand from household will be reduced. So at the end, there's no multiply effect. That's the theory. But if you think carefully, the theory, as I just described, assume the government spending will not promote productivity. If the government spending promote productivities, growth, increase the productivity, then the future growth will become larger, right? And the government can rely on the higher growth increase in the government revenue to pay for the cost now. Under the kind of situation, the regarding equivalence does not necessary to be there. And then we need to think, in our country or in our economy, is there opportunity to make those kind of productivity enhancing type of investment? Well, in high income country, it may not be so easy. Because high income country, in general, the infrastructure is very good. For example, in Japan in the 1990s, they encountered a situation like this. So they rely on Keynesian's ideas to make a lot of fiscal stimulus. And the way they make fiscal stimulus, I had a friend in Japan in the 1990s, he told me. He stayed in Japan for four years. In those four years, the road in front of his apartment was dig out, paved, dig out, and paved six times in four years. That's fiscal stimulus by Keynesian ideas. Keynesian said if you dig a hole, you fill a hole, it's a demand. But in the future, people need to pay tax, right? So as a result, the fiscal stimulus in Japan was not very effective. But if you look into China in 1998 to 2002, China also encountered the Asian financial crisis, the reduction in the external demand. China also had a recession, uh, 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 not recession, excess capacity. So from 1998, China started to introduce fiscal stimulus. But if you look into the fiscal stimulus in China, again, it's similarly to pave road, to build a highway. But those highways are all new highways, right? They were not there before. And so those kind of new highway, like in 97, the highway system in China was this them 5,000 kilometers. And by the time of 2002, the highway system in China increased to 25,000 kilometers. And certainly those kind of highway investment reduce the enterprise's transaction cost, right? Now with the highway system, it's much more efficient. The transaction cost will reduce a lot, time reduce a lot, and so their productivity increased a lot after 2002. And with that, the government revenue increased a lot. So you can see that government deficit as a percentage of GDP in 97 was less than 20%. And it, it increased to 36% by the time of 2002. But now it's down to 20% again. And during this period of time, 
the Chinese government did not raise tax. And the reason that the government deficit is a percentage of GDP decline was because of productivity improvement growth increase, government revenue increased. And so it's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> we need to study economic theory. But if you want to make your theory work, we are training work. The most important thing is to understand the phenomena, understand the mechanism behind the phenomena. And economics only tells us how to do the analysis. If you try to apply the theory without trying to understand the phenomenon, sometimes good intention can cause very bad consequence. But if you try to understand the phenomenon, all your training will be so valuable. I have a book in Chinese, but you may be able to buy the book from here to talk about methodologies and you know, how to learn economics, how to apply economics. And for that, I have more discussion about the question that you have in mind. But I like to say, your question is so important for us trained as economists. Thank you. Congratulations, Sestin. I don't have to invite the audience to thank you. They've done it voluntarily. <laughs> and thank you very much for being such a great audience. Uh, we have to draw this to a close because we have the press waiting for Professor Lin. And uh, please uh, read the newspapers tomorrow. Whatever questions you were unable to ask will be answered in tomorrow's papers. And uh, Professor Edward Chan, would you? like to come up here and deliver and say something to close this uh, re session before uh, we adjourn the day. Um, okay, maybe I'll just say a few words. Uh, Justin, thank you so much uh, for the uh, wonderful and insightful uh, talk, please, please sit down. <laughs> um, I always uh, listen to Justin and read his work with uh, admiration because it's always very insightful. I learn a lot. And tonight's speech is of no exception. Before you go, I just try to recap. I will remember four things from now on from you. Uh, first, it's very important to note the global economic imbalance and the global financial crisis are nothing related to relative prices, nothing to do with exchange rates. So the RMB is more or less at the right exchange rate. So don't speculate on the uh, uh, RMB too much. And actually, Justin went so far to argue if China would appreciate its currency, it would be even worse for global imbalance because U.S. has to import from somewhere else at a higher price or from China, again, at a higher price. Uh, lesson number two from you, the global imbalance and crisis are because of structural factors. Structural factors are long-term factors. It takes time to resolve. One factor is because of the financial deregulation, and therefore we need a tighter control in future. The other factor is related to the overdoing in quantitative easing after the dot-com bubble burst. And as a result, the saving rate between China and the United States was ever widening. US was saving nothing, while China was saving over 50%. Simple national income accounting will give you the answer of trade deficit you know, on the side of the US. But I think um, Justin made a very important point. When I read everywhere, the high saving rate in China was due to the lack of social security protection. But Justin made a very important point. It was more due to income inequality, income distribution related especially 
to the over concentration on the saving in the corporate sector and the monopolies associated with that sector. So this is a very important point and thank you very much. So China has to adjust to spend more and US has to save more on the other hand. Lesson number three. Today we have excess capacity in the near future. Not until 2013, that's a relatively bad news. So recession will be with us perhaps until the year 2013. With excess capacity, Justin's recommendation is not to adopt exit strategy too soon. It's good news. All right, so we are going to have some good times until 2013. The last lesson number three, which is also very important, while in using the quantitative stimulation packages, it's important not to think of purely in the conventional static Keynesian, Keynesian terms. It's not just to spend money to meet current demand, but to spend money for the future, for enhancing productivity and to reduce environmental degradation. So these are the very important lessons I'm sure we have all learned. And thank you so very much, Justin. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Justin. And thank you, my students. Um, my students in the 1970s and other students made this any event possible. Thank you so much. But it's not so much just for the event, but for your idea, Jun Si Jong Do. Respect for the teacher and mentor. We must, you know, keep this idea in mind. Thank you very much. Well, I, I have to say, I, I spent more than one hour. I still could not make my idea clear. <laughs> and I will spend less than five minutes and uh, made my idea so clear. Thank you very much. This is the end of the Edward K. Y. Chen Distinguished Lecture. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again in next year's Edward K. Y. Chen Distinguished Lecture Series. Good night.